evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. We appreciate um, everybody's time to come out here and, and celebrate past and all of the work that our volunteers have contributed over the last year or couple of years. My name is Dr. Jeanette Schnars. I'm the Executive Director of the Regional Science Consortium. A lot of you already know that. Um, so we're located in the research wing of this building here. And myself and David Bouton from Pennsylvania Sea Grant are co-founders of the PAST organization. Um, he came up with it and we got together and moved it forward. And we are fortunate to have all of you as participants um, in a, a working group that has done so much over the last four years. And so our working group, um, we just want to acknowledge we have uh, quite a diversity of people from different organizations and people that bring different talents to the group. And by having such a diverse team, we've been able to, I think, accomplish a lot over, over our uh, four years now, five years maybe yeah. now. Yeah. So one of the things we really wanted to highlight is um, all the work that you've done. We have a lot of our dive team here and um, wanted to acknowledge all the work that you guys do and all the information that you bring to the surface that we're able to share with other people that are not divers. And we also have our historian here um, who has contributed a great deal of research and looking information up and also being able to put that on the website. I also want to acknowledge um, staff from Pennsylvania DEP that are not here tonight that are also working on marine spatial plan and have taken a lot of side scan <coughs> sonar images that we have on the website as well. So all of this information from many different organizations, many different people has come together and, and really been something um, significant and it really highlights the synergy of the, the team that we have. So we are going to make this kind of quick because we want to definitely get to our guest speaker this evening. And we want to acknowledge um, some of you that have contributed so much. Our first person that we want to acknowledge for the evening um, really helped a lot in terms of getting funding to keep past moving forward. Even though we have a lot of dedicated people and a lot of momentum, unfortunately it always takes funding to keep that momentum going. And um, so we want to acknowledge, and when I call your name you have to come down, we want to acknowledge Michael Hyde who works for Scott Electric. And Michael helped us uh, secure some funding for our dive team to keep them underwater more often this season, last season. And um, he was just, you know, came out and visited the Regional Science Consortium several times and we talked about the project and he's just hey, been a great nice. contributor. Nice. Good way yeah. to get started. Appreciate it. A certificate yeah. and a shirt. We can fix that since we didn't know the number <laughs> until now. Oh, so yeah. We'll have to yeah. Adjust that. Oh, yes. And then we'll you have to problem. smile at the camera. You have to back okay. up and smile. Thanks. Ready? Pose, <laughs> pose. Yeah. Well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right. Round of applause Thank for Michael, you. folks. So, um, yeah, Michael helped a lot with that, and we are fortunate to have him as a member of our team as well. Our next person that we want to acknowledge is our historian of our group, Jerry Skripsack with the Sons of Lake Erie, who has spent a lot of time digging through all kinds of archives, whether it's newspapers or online or visiting places. Jerry Skripsack, come on down. Jerry's been a great asset, and um, usually when we come up with a question, he's like, I'll, I'll research it and figure it out. So that's always great to have. And, I know it's taken a lot of time to do the work that he's done. It takes longer to walk down the steps. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to stand here and pose for the camera. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Thank you Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for everything. Appreciate it. You wear a bunch of hats and they're all colorful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> The next person we want to acknowledge um, has been one of the leaders of our uh, past team and helps organize a very specific role for the scuba divers and we meet and we plan what, you know, what are we going to do this season, which shipwrecks, which dives, how, what kind of information are we going to collect and then he goes back and coordinates all the divers. So Matt Dickey, come on down. And 
so that's been a great asset as well because um, there's a lot of data that we want to collect and we want to do it when we have lots of good visibility. Thank you, thank you David. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. And then you tell it. <laughs> Very good. All right, round of applause again for Matt. Thank you. And then the next person we want to acknowledge also really helps tremendously with our dive team, getting them out there, keeping them safe, keeping them organized. Um, and we can't, we can't do it without him because we need to get those divers out there to the correct sites and, and doing the dives and doing the dives when it's, it's safe and conditions are safe. So we want to please acknowledge Pete Schaefer, who is the captain of the scuba boat that takes everybody out there. Um, for all his efforts. Pete, come on down. And I've been out on our boat watching Pete in action, and he really does make sure everybody does what they're supposed to do and only goes out Thank in you. safe conditions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, then you stand and you post. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, round of applause for Pete. All right. All right, I'm taking over for the dive team here, and I want to start it off because we have the purpose here tonight is to recognize the people that contribute to the PASS program. And the real working group of the PASS is really the divers. When this originally came about, as most people here are aware, it started with the shipwreck that was found off of Prescott in 2013. And that eventually morphed into the understanding that there wasn't a lot of resources within Pennsylvania to document the shipwrecks and tell the story of these shipwrecks, because we're Pennsylvanians. We're not necessarily known as a shipwreck state. So uh, when you talk about the real work that's done, the original idea was spun off of a project that was going on with the Department of Environmental Protection, and that was a marine spatial survey. So the idea was that as they had a tow fish and were mowing the lawn offshore to try to identify the anomalies, which eventually were determined to be shipwrecks, that we would be given the coordinates as the past survey team and go out and survey the shipwrecks. Well, it hasn't worked out exactly that way, but uh, we've got 132 different shipwrecks to work on. And if one of those shipwrecks takes four or five dives, dives depending upon the conditions and the amount of stuff that we have to do on the shipwreck, you can do the math to figure out how long it would take to document 132 shipwrecks within the quadrangle of Pennsylvania. Without the volunteer divers, none of this could happen. So the real, real purpose and the presence here we want to feel tonight is acknowledgement of the efforts that were made by the divers and what an important ingredient that is to making this successful. So I can't say enough about how grateful we are for all of these volunteers that give up their time. For every 1,000 people that may be enamored with lay beneath the waters, there may be one diver amidst that 1,000 that is brave enough to go below. So for all you divers out there, thank you for bringing the bottom to the surface so the rest of the land lovers can appreciate it. So, Let's recognize our first diver. Do we have Ryan Cook in the house? Come on down. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. And then come on, stand right here. Here's your certificate. Thank you. <laughs> Picture. Thank you. All right, round of applause for Ryan, please. <laughs> Next diver down, Adam. Both Ryan and Adam are from the graduating class of 2016. Adam is also the shipwright on the Niagara, for those of you that may not know him. What was your first dive with the team there? I think it was the uh, Martin. The Martin. On oh, the Martin. Yeah, okay. I, I believe so. All right. Picture. Picture time. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Adam. 
Adam, come on back down here. We have Jenny Martin, ladies and gentlemen, who wasn't able to make it here tonight. Jenny is our artist. She's also gone through the past training, and she's been a contributor for uh, the shipwreck exhibit upstairs. If you haven't seen, had an opportunity to look at the gallery there along with uh, Jeremy. So please pass our, our thanks on to Jenny there. Will do. Thank you. All right, is Andrew in the house? Andrew Carley is not, not here? All right, for those of, uh, we had some last minute flus, we're gonna pass those on. Matt Dickey, would that be all right to leave those with you to get to the right people? Yeah. Very well, sir. All right, Corey Briggs, come on down. Jason Travis, come on down here, please. Jason's uh, in the tropics. <laughs> uh, we won't make him come back for this shirt then, all right? Let's see where he is. Jay Galloway. Thumbs up sign from Jeremy before we can do anything else. <laughs> All right, I'm looking uh, amongst some divers in the group. Would Jeremy Bannister please step down? <laughs> Let's hear it for Jeremy Bannister, please. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, I Jeremy, a smile for the camera, please. Okay. Let's give Jeremy a thumbs up. Thumbs it's up. good. All right. <laughs> Make him return for the t-shirt. <laughs> Luke Fosber? Luke is unfortunately ill. Oh no, another flu casualty. We have a gentleman by the name of Michael Moulton in the house. Come on down here. Got it. Yay. All right, round of applause for Michael. Randy Knoll. Sick. Uh, Another flu casualty. Whole house. Whole house. Okay. Stephen High. Come on down. I determined that Tom was not able to make it this evening. Family, okay. All right, folks, this is, uh, this is the end of our list for recognizing the divers now. The divers that we've recognized tonight have been divers that have gone through the certification and actually done some work on some of the dives. So we've had two graduating classes, one in 2016 and one in 2017. There were additional divers that were certified uh, in the NAWI, uh, per, uh, the, the NAWI uh, Pass Survey course but not all, all of them were able to get out as volunteers to participate. So there were additional divers. Matt, what's, what's the total number of divers? I think we've gone through 30? About 26 people. About 26? Yeah. Okay. So and we are hoping perhaps to run that course again. That's under discussion now. So that is very specific uh, up to this project. So 
Um, let's see what else we want to do. I know we want to get to the speaker, but I did want to kind of wrap up recognizing the divers, um, who I think most of you are aware of some of the work that went on this past weekend, where we had Indiana University of Pennsylvania here, a research team of four that came up with uh, a radiometer and ground penetrating radar to do an ice survey on Misery Bay. And uh, as it turns out, there's a couple divers who go out every Sunday and go ice diving. And uh, they just happened to be open to maybe shifting their location. So it was half day Friday, very full day, both Saturday and Sunday, sun up to sundown, where they were mowing the lawn on the ice. And the ice was about 10, uh, 10 inches thick where we were uh, focused on one of 15 different target areas that had been identified by aerial maps as promising uh, area, areas for a survey. So on our first uh, survey target, it was a bust. There was a, an anomaly that was detected from the aerial photo. Um, the second anomaly that was GPS on the location, we, we got a hit. So we zeroed in on the dive team and we had, how many divers was it, Jeremy? We had four? Four. Four divers. And uh, we were able to cut dead center over the top of this anomaly and there wasn't much room to work there. Um, it was fairly good conditions, but these are, this is diving underneath the ice. So this team, which is a part of PASS, took the time to come out and support something that happened right on the moment. And uh, I can't say that we've discovered uh, a huge shipwreck, but right now we have been able to confirm that we have a submerged, submerged a man-made structure in Misery Bay that was unknown, that has, been, that has been buried underneath the sediment and that would have never been found by conventional means of uh, survey. So I wanted to thank uh, the dive team, and I might also mention that uh, Stephen was there both Saturday and Sunday, and uh, we had somebody else who came out on Saturday. Didn't we have another past member that came out? Yep, thank you for taking the time to come out and participate in that and be a part of it. So I know you guys are here. I'd like to move on to the speaker if I could at this point, if we missed anything, okay. I think that uh, it is time to bring down the world famous Kevin McGee. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin McGee is co-founder and deputy director of the Cleveland Underwater Explorers Organization, all right? Um, he's been a diver since the mid 80s and we're very fortunate to have him here tonight. He's a walking encyclopedia on shipwrecks. What I really like about Kevin is he's open to conversation and that he's allotted some time at the end of his presentation for you who represent more of a diving community than most to take it beyond question and answer and uh, hopefully initiate a discussion of mutual interest. So uh, thank you so much for being here tonight, Kevin. Let's have an applause for Kevin to get him riled up on his uh, presentation. Okay, everybody, thank you for coming tonight and congratulations to all the people that got awards tonight. Uh, that's actually quite a, a good accomplishment. And in fact, uh, PAST itself, I think, is actually a very good organization. Uh, very similar to actually some of the things that I do as well. Uh, so let me introduce myself a little further. Um, I uh, am a member of a lot of different underwater organizations that center around shipwrecks. And uh, in particular, of course, as uh, David mentioned, I'm Cleveland Underwater Explorers, or CLU. Uh, we operate out of Cleveland. Um, and uh, we, Dave, my uh, buddy Dave Van Zant and I actually formed this group to find shipwrecks in Lake Erie. Uh, since then, we've found about 25 shipwrecks, uh, some famous, some not. Uh, but nevertheless, we've been pretty successful at it. And, uh, and along the way, of course, we've also worked very closely with the Great Lakes Historical Society. Uh, which is now the National Museum of the Great Lakes in Toledo. I highly recommend getting out there. And a little side organization called MAST that is off of it, the Maritime Archaeological Survey Team. Sound familiar? Kind of similar. Uh, and actually, it's very similar. It uh, does the same thing. It's a group of avocational divers uh, that actually go out every year and survey shipwrecks in Ohio waters in Lake Erie. Um, and of course, I'm a member of several dive clubs as well. Bay Area Divers, or BAD, and Lake Erie Rock Divers, or LUD. You kind of see a theme going there. Um, I uh, 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 do a lot of stuff both off-season and on-season with shipwrecks. And so tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this body of water. I think you're all familiar with it. Uh, if not, just look to the north. You can't miss it. 
uh, Lake Erie itself. And of course, what most people probably know, uh, but not the general public, is that this was a major transportation artery uh, through the 1800s. This is really how America expanded west. Uh, the Great Lakes system in general, and Lake Erie in particular. Uh, if you were a settler or somebody wanted to go out west and you're in New York City, you didn't get on a wagon train in New York City, you got on a boat. You went up the, the Hudson River, uh, you got on a Navy, another boat, a canal boat, came across the Erie Canal, and you ended up in Buffalo. And uh, there you get on yet another boat, go, you go down early on the length of Lake Erie, settling somewhere in Cleveland, uh, Maumee, Detroit, or later on pressing on all the way to Chicago. And that's where you get on your wagon train. And so you have this flow of people coming westward by the Great Lakes predominantly. Uh, at the same time, the people as they settle start producing grain, lumber, uh, iron ore, and all the stuff is coming back flowing to the East Coast for uh, uh, the factories. So you have finished goods and people going west, and you have raw materials coming back east. And this was a busy corridor. Um, uh, any given season, there may be 10,000, 15,000 ships on the Great Lakes. Uh, and of course, this is the 1800s, uh, made out of wood predominantly early on, and even later on with metal. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fires, They're, they hit each other a lot, there's no radar, no weather forecasts, and the end result is, is a lot of ships ended up sinking. Uh, nobody knows the number, by the way. Uh, anybody tells you they know the number out there is lying. Um, nobody kept records, uh, at least early on. Uh, most of the ships that uh, sank uh, maybe would be recorded in the local newspaper uh, off the coast where the ship sank, or maybe where the ship originated at. And I might point out, just because a ship sank doesn't mean it's there anymore. A lot of these ships sank two, three, four, or five times in their career. And the sinking usually made the news, the raising not so much. And so just because you heard of a shipwreck doesn't mean it's even still there. It could easily have been raised and put right back into service. These vessels were made to create money for people, and sitting on the bottom, you're not making money. So they frequently raise these things. The best estimates range somewhere between 500 and 3,000 shipwrecks in Lake Erie. And I might point out that that is an incredibly dense shipwreck population. Even at the lower number, 500, given the small size of Lake Erie, that's denser than, say, the Bermuda Triangle or other places like that in the world. That's a lot of shipwrecks. Um, this is just a few of them. Uh, right now, there's about 200, 250 that are known uh, in Lake Erie. Um, and uh, you can see they're scattered all over. Um, you notice there's choke points, like maybe the Peely Passage around Cleveland or Long Point. But that's not because that's where a lot of ships sank. It's just where people have looked. Uh, you notice out in the middle, it's a little sparse. Doesn't mean there's not a lot of shipwrecks out there. It's just really hard to get to and search. And so as a result, very little has been found. Uh, the ones out in the middle are usually gone after because uh, there's really good references to where they might be, and so people have gone to look for them. Uh, but there's a lot out there and uh, a lot of potential. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you kind of a general tour of Lake Erie. How many people here have dove places like in the central basin or the western basin of Lake Erie? Okay, a few people. In my opinion, Lake Erie is really three different lakes. Um, you've got the western basin, you've got the central basin, and of course, off of Erie here, you have the eastern basin. And you get very different shipwrecks depending on where you are in the lake um, and different diving conditions. So I'm going to kind of start uh, in the western basin and give you a tour coming east as to what you usually see as a diver. And for you non-divers, you'll by the end at least have a very good appreciation for what us divers see under the lake. So let's start in the western basin. A western basin is the shallowest. Average depth is only 24 feet. Uh, there is a 50-foot depth just south of South Bass Island. It's called the Starve Island Deep. It's a little scour hole um, in the bedrock. But for the most part, you're talking pretty shallow water. Uh, 30, 35 foot is not unusual. Um, the average visibility, by the way, is, is probably the worst here. Uh, only three to five foot of visibility. Sometimes you get up to 15 foot of this. Uh, but for the most part, it's a, a real mud hole. And the reason is, is because of the Detroit River and the Maumee River putting all that silt into a relatively shallow basin. The bottom tends to be a really thick, gooey mud. Uh, algae blooms are pretty frequent due to all the uh, phosphates in the water from the farming that happens in the Great Black Swamp, the dismal swamp that exists in this area. And so the end result is, is that visibility is never really particularly good. However, there are about 50 shipwrecks that are known. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you a couple of them. First, I'm going to start at Kelly's Island, just north of it in the North Bay, a ship called the Adventure. 
Uh, it's just uh, about 100 feet from shore uh, in 5 to 15 feet of water. Oops. And this is what it looked like before it sank. It originally started life as a schooner, and then after the 1900s was converted into a steam barge. They put an engine boiler on it, trying to keep it profitable, and it started hauling limestone out of Kelly's Island. And in fact, that's where it ended its life at when it caught fire at the dock um, one day. The, uh, uh, because the fire was spreading across the ship and could be put out, the Tug Smith decided to take charge and actually push it away from the dock and the other ships that were there, and then took aboard survivors from the vessel. The captain, his wife, their young daughter, and all the crew were saved. And the ship was left to burn and kind of drifted ashore and grounded and then just burned to the waterline. And then, of course, it was salvaged. They removed the boiler, the engine. Uh, the upper works were cleared because of the hazard navigation. And then it just kind of sat there and people forgot about it. Later, it was found. And this is what it looks like today. This is the, uh, essentially all that's really left is the keelson, the frames, uh, some of the ceiling, uh, and a little bit of the prop and the prop shaft at the uh, stern end. Uh, and this is not unusual for what you would find in the Western Basin. Uh, but one of the problems is, of course, it's shallow, and so ships tend to stick out of water, and there's at least two instances I know where ships have hit other ships that were sunken uh, and sank themselves. So they're hazards to navigation, and they're frequently cleared, wire drag, dynamited, whatever. Even if a ship isn't having that done to it, and it's in safely, safely deep enough water, Ultimately, the ice is going to take its toll on it. Uh, ice can get down to about 30 foot of depth, and it will tear up these wrecks over time. The end result is, is really all you ever really end up with is the bottom of the ship. Um, and that's pretty much what you see here. By the way, does this look familiar? This is actually the logo for Mast. This was the very first shipwreck that was surveyed in Ohio waters by avocational divers uh, way back in 1997. It was a project led, led by Joyce Hayward and Patrick Laverty. And uh, um, they, this is the survey result, the, the general site plan. And uh, Mast actually grew out of this survey. They did one other ship called the Prince, uh, and then formed what we call Mast today after that. So if that looks familiar, it's because it's really Mast's logo. OK, so that's pretty typical of a shallow water wreck in the Western Basin. Let me take you to one of the deeper ones. It's kind of cheating. It's right at the edge. It's right here. Oops just north of Vermilion, about eight miles straight out, in 50 feet of water, uh, called the Anthony Wayne. And as you probably saw, this is what it looked like in its heyday. Uh, it was a side paddle wheel steamer. Um, and this is one of the earliest, if not uh, the last remaining, early wooden steamers in Lake Erie, and maybe all the Great Lakes. Uh, it sank in 1850, when the boilers exploded at one in the morning while traveling from Sandusky to Cleveland. Um, the boilers, of course, are where the smokestacks are on the ship. And uh, that's actually the saloon there in the hurricane deck right over the boilers. Uh, by all accounts, at 1 in the morning, the saloon was packed with people, and that's actually the vast majority of the casualties when those boilers exploded uh, in 1850. Um, 38 passengers and crew did perish. Uh, the ship sank, and uh, the rest of the people were saved because the hurricane deck blew away, and everybody ended up clinging to the top. There were three boats aboard. One was destroyed in the explosion. Uh, there was a yaw you can see hanging off the back that was saved. And there was uh, one other lifeboat on the ship that didn't get destroyed in the explosion. Uh, by accounts of the passengers that went to the hurricane deck and were hanging on uh, with the deck floating above the wreck, uh, is that the captain got in one boat, the first mate got in the other. They said, we're going to go for help, and paddled away. Um, they were ultimately rescued by a passing schooner. Um, and, and actually, the captain did go to Sandusky and raise the alarm and get a steamer from Kelly's Island up. and. They actually met the schooner coming towards Sandusky with help. But uh, it didn't go over well in the press, by the way. It's fun to read those articles. This is what the wreck looks like today. Uh, this is a side scan sonar image of the wreck. This is found by Tom Kolchek from Clue uh, back in 2006. Um, for those that aren't familiar with side scan, I think everybody here might be, but just in case you aren't, think of side scan sonar as an overhead aerial photograph of the lake bottom but it's taken with sound instead of light. And just like the name implies, um, the, the picture is actually looking out to the side. And so what that means is, I'm going to go ahead and get my laser pointer here. So the boat is traveling like this. You can't see directly underneath because it's dark, and it's only looking out to the sides. 
But what you can see is the two paddle wheels, the connecting shaft in between, some of the cranks, some of the pitman arm, and on this side you can see the bow over here. Um, you don't see much in between, and that is because of unique conditions of Western Basin. This is what it looks like for those that can't really see side scan images in their mind very well. Uh, this was done by uh, uh, Texas A&M, who actually came out and surveyed the shipwreck for two seasons. Uh, they anchored over a top. They did this very nice survey and, and site picture. Uh, they also spent a year dredging and uncovering this horizontal crosshead engine that you can't see buried in the silt here. Everything is still there, by the way. The hull is actually there under the silt. And this is not unusual for Western Basin ships. Most of them are pretty heavily buried. Um, in this case, it's just the paddle wheels that stick up and a little bit of the bow and some king posts up at the front. So that, that's pretty typical. Um, if you were to dive the ship, this is what you would see. And by the way, this was taken about probably six to eight foot of visibility, which is better than I've ever seen on the wreck. I've only seen three to five, so this is phenomenal. Um, our friend the Quagga mussel, of course, is still here clustering around, and they're a mixed blessing. Um, they, they've made the water clearer. Uh, but by the same token, they've covered everything you want to see. In this case, though, you can still see the bucket, uh, the spokes, uh, the arms of the paddle wheel. Oops. He wants to be close. There we are. Um, this is the interesting part. So one of the things I do is I'm an engineer as well, a mechanical engineer. So when I see machinery parts, I always get very excited. Um, this is the pitman arm that goes off to that very horizontal crosshead engine. And this is one of the cranks that goes to the uh, port, crank, port shaft. And this is the starboard crank going to the starboard shaft for the paddle wheel there. And then you have this thing in between. It's an intermediate link. It only exists on the port side. There's none on the starboard side. And this is, to me, one of the things about shipwrecks that I really like. They sometimes ask you questions you didn't even know to ask. Um, we've talked to a lot of experts in steam propulsion, a lot of people that know boats. Nobody can tell us why that intermediate link is there. Um, the horizontal crosshead engine was retrofitted in. The boat started life with a vertical crosshead engine. So this obviously was added later in its life, but nobody can tell us why that intermediate link is there. Um, and we've, we've looked. We still don't understand why. But that's the beauty of shipwrecks, is you actually see them the way they really were. And when they uncovered that crosshead engine, horizontal crosshead engine, all the levers and things that were in their final position before the boilers exploded were in the positions the engineers left them in right before. Um, nobody had ever really seen an engine that old of that type. So it's really cool to be able to see shipwrecks and see these things as they actually were, uh, the actual construction of, of these ships that weren't well documented. These things were built by craftsmen. And so there are no drawings. Uh, there are no uh, anything that you can research beyond the ship itself. And that's really what shipwrecks are. Here's the bow, by the way, the pointy end of the boat looking aft. Uh, there are two anchors just off to the side here. The, they're buried with the woodstocks just sticking out. See a couple of king posts in the back. And there's not much else to see. This is actually a very historically significant shipwreck. Uh, like I said, this is the oldest known uh, steamer in the Great Lakes, or Lake Erie and probably the Great Lakes. There were earlier ones, and they did sink, but they're not there anymore. They were either salvaged or uh, torn up or things like that ashore. Um, for instance, Walk in the Water, the very first one, wrecked right off of Buffalo. And its wreckage was taken and used for to build a shanty town on the shore. So it's not there anymore. Okay, so that's the western base of Lake Erie. Um, ironically, by the way, the western basin is where most of the divers are and most of the boats. Sandusky is a very popular boating center. And then as you go east, it becomes less about boating and things like that. Uh, but the Central Basin still has a lot of boats based out of Cleveland and Lorraine and uh, places like that. And this is an area that's a little bit deeper, certainly a lot more surface area. About 60 foot on average. Uh, it is, does heat to 80 foot out here in the middle, a big bowl. And average this is actually better. 5 to 10 foot of visibility. Uh, I have seen up to 35 foot. And there's about 60 known wrecks here, and they're more intact. Um, I'm going to zoom into Cleveland just a little bit. About 40 known shipwrecks in the Cleveland area, the Lorraine area, kind of seen scattered around here. And in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this one right here, uh, about 14 miles off of Rocky River, straight out, called the Dundee. Now, the Dundee is a really cool shipwreck. I like the Dundee. This is what it will look like in its heyday. Um, it was built in 1893 as a schooner barge. 
What a scooter barge means is this is the end of the age of sail. They're still building wooden sailing vessels, but nobody expects to actually sail these things. They're just towed consorts, they're barges, uh, that look like sailing ships. The idea was is a lot of the early steamers didn't have a lot of carrying capacity. And so this is actually not a picture of the Dundee. This is the Miztec, which is currently sunk up in Lake Superior, but virtually identical to the Dundee's build. You got three masts, uh, cut down, not full sails, and you got the tow line you can see going off probably to the Myron. That was the steamer connected with the Miztec for most of its life. Ironically, they sank a few miles apart in completely different occasions. Um, the Dundee was sailing along in September of 1900 when a big storm came up. What they didn't know was actually the Galveston hurricane. Swept up through the Great Lakes after destroying Galveston and killing anywhere from 10 to 15,000 people. Uh, swept over the Great Lakes and sank quite a few vessels as well. The Dundee was one of them. Now, fortunately, it's only 68 feet of water. That means the top of these masts stuck out of the water. And almost all the crew was saved. Uh, there were seven crew aboard, uh, which the idea with these scooter barges was if they ran into trouble, they would cast loose and fend for themselves and try to sail to port. Uh, and if not, and they had nice weather, the, the steamers would be able to pull two, three, four of these things and greatly extend its profits. So that's exactly what happened. They cast loose, they sank. Everybody made it top except for the female cook. And by the way, this is a pattern you see over and over on the ships. If anybody's going to die on the ship, it's always the female cook. I don't know why. Um, the captain went down with the ship, um, and, the, and or the captain was, and the five crew remaining were on the masts and were picked up the next day by a steamer. This is what the wreck looks like today, and this is one of the signature wrecks of Cleveland. It's awesome. Unlike uh, a lot of ships, this thing stands about five, eight feet off the bottom. Um, you can see all the cargo hatches here, um, and you can fully penetrate inside the shipwreck. Uh, here's the cabin. Uh, the pointy end of the boat's over here. You can still see the floor joists, the tiller, and the, the rudder posts as the transom torn off. Decking is mostly intact. You can actually see where the decking's missing. It's a beautiful side scan, by the way. And the bows collapsed a little bit, donkey boiler, windlass, things like that up there. You can, as a diver, actually go into this cargo hatch, swim all the way down, come out here, turn around, swim all the way back if you want. Um, it's a really cool wreck, and there's a lot to see on this wreck. It's a big wreck, 35 foot beam, 212 feet long. So it's a really cool wreck. Did I say that enough times? So this is a picture of the deck winch, about midships there. Um, see the nice style, it's a later build style. Um, and I'll point out that you'll notice something you're probably pretty familiar with. Running through these pictures, you'll see the center line, uh, the baseline tape. Uh, this is, these pictures were taken during mass survey of the ship, so you'll see a lot of the baseline kind of going through it. Of course, there was no mooring on it, so they put a mooring on it and used the, uh, the, wind, or the winch as the, the tie-in point, uh, put a buoy up there. Um, by the way, for those of you that aren't divers, um, everybody kind of has the impression, it seems, that you come up to the coordinates and you just jump over, drop to the bottom, and there's a shipwreck. It's not the way it really works. Um, you gotta anchor into these things and follow the anchor line down to the shipwreck, especially in Lake Erie where visibility is not good and if you're 10 feet away, 15 feet away, and this is only five, you're never gonna find that shipwreck. So you always wanna tie in and come down on a known point. And moorings are really good for that, much appreciated. Not every wreck has a mooring and sometimes you gotta anchor in, but even then you want your anchor going to the wreck. So here's some more pictures of, of the uh, shipwreck. Here's the mizzen mass. It actually snapped off that last uh, later in the season due to ice. Uh, here you can see a diver uh, going over the midships, uh, probably right about there based on the missing decking. Here's a hatch combing. Uh, you can see the missing decking behind them. Of course, the center line tape running down the middle, the baseline. Here's the main mast. It's missing entirely. It's still a bit of the uh, mast collar around it as well. Uh, this might have been pulled for salvage or something. Maybe it survived the winter, but there's no sign of it. It probably was, was pulled sometime later. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like going inside these things. Now, obviously, I'll do the normal thing. You know, don't go inside wrecks unless you're properly trained. But this is one of the safer wrecks. You can see there's a lot of overhead. This is a divider that runs pretty much down the full length of the wreck with center posts. Uh, here's the nice clear water above and the hatch combing and you actually could swim through pretty easy. And if you're into trouble, you just go up, follow the ceiling, and you'll see one of those big hatches sooner or later. You really can't get too much trouble. Okay, so that's one shipwreck off of Cleveland. Give you a kind of idea. I'll show you one more. 
It's called the Sultan, way over to the east here, two miles off of Euclid, uh, and about 40 feet of water. And a lot of people really love this shipwreck. Uh, it's an easy shipwreck to dive, relatively shallow water, but there's a lot to see and do on it. So this is what it looked like in its heyday. Uh, in its heyday, it was actually a brigantine, which for those of you who know ships, means two masted, four mast square rigged, main mast was uh, scooter rigged, or four and a half gaff. Um, built in 1848, kind of one of the earlier ones, and uh, sank in a storm during the Civil War in 1864 off of Cleveland. The young captain decided he was going to show everybody how it was done. He left Cleveland when all the older captains told him to stay in port. Uh, he was headed to Buffalo and didn't make it more than a couple miles before he ran into trouble. He was carrying a deck load of grindstones. They started pitching them overboard trying to save the boat, which just caused those grindstones to start moving around. And uh, then ultimately it sank uh, with uh, everybody taking to the mass. The four masts snapped off, killing all the four people there on that. Three people, including the captain, his brother, and the first mate, were on the main mast. One by one through the night, the captain and his brother dropped off, leaving only the first mate left the next day for a ship to pick up. Um, kind of tragic, especially since a lot of the crew died within sight of their, their houses. Uh, half the crew lived in the Euclid area. Um, this is what the shipwreck looks like today. Pointy ends up here, it's actually kind of blunt looking. Uh, down here you have the stern and beautiful shadow. You can actually see the railing is intact right here. Um, and this is a site plan that Clue created when we did the first dives on it. You can actually see all the grindstones kind of over here on the starboard side. The ship is tilted about 30 degrees to the starboard. And all the grindstones that were left on the deck are on that railing. And that kind of makes the dive. All those grindstones, by the way, are Berea sandstone from Berea just south of Cleveland. They were loaded in Cleveland before it set sail. A uh, lot to see and do on this wreck. It's a diver's favorite. Uh, the windlass here up front with a chain locker. Uh, we've got the railing, of course. Intact railings are always nice. Um, here's some of the grindstones. And some are big. Some are uh, eight, almost six, eight feet across. Others are relatively small, three, four foot across. Um, so a whole bunch of different sizes, some stacks, some just loosely put. But again, a lot to see and do on this wreck. And in fact, this wreck uh, is kind of an experiment. So MAST actually went ahead and uh, we released the coordinates to this when Clue found it. And they put a mooring on it so no more damage would happen to the wreck with people anchoring in. And it's now open to the public. And they did a, a two season survey of it and the archeological report's now been released. And people have been really good with this wreck. Divers have been very protective of it. It's kind of an experiment to see how the dive culture has changed. There's even ceramics on the wreck that so far mostly stayed put. A few have disappeared, but some are, most are still there, I'd say. And that's really encouraging. By the way, this uh, uh, teacup here is diagnostic. So this ship actually spent, right before the start of the Civil War, time operating out of New York Harbor. This is actually uh, English crockery. Uh, from an English company that sold only in New York City. And it around the same time that the ship was there. So this, little things like this can actually tell you a lot about a ship's ID and where it was at and help you. Of course, really, there's only one ship it could be. It's a, it's a brigantine with uh, grindstones on the deck. That pretty much nailed it there. Plus the dimensions were spot on to the registration dimensions. This is the final survey picture, the plan site for the Sultan. Uh, like I said, fun dive, only 40 foot of water. We spent uh, an hour, we spent over an hour on the shipwreck. It's uh, a fun, fun dive, and uh, a lot of divers do their first Lake Erie shipwreck dive on this lake, wreck now. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of what you can find off the Cleveland area, in the, the central basin. So now let's head to water's probably a lot more familiar with the people in this room. Uh, the Eastern Basin. Now the Eastern Basin is the deepest part of the lake. Average is 80, but of course, right off a of long point, you get about 210 feet of water here. Uh, there are no shipwrecks in the 210 foot part, but there's uh, about four of them in the 190, 185 depth point. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of them are shallower, about 100 foot for the, the nicer ones. Uh, and so there's a lot to see to do. What really makes the Eastern Basin diving nice, at least in my mind, is the visibility. I mean, you're averaging probably 40 to 60 foot of visibility. I have seen well over 100 foot of visibility. I've been on sh schooners, or actually barkentines, and on the bow I can see the stern. That's really good. 
Um, it's almost tropical water at times. I've actually seen what you would swear is tropical, except for the fact that I'm in a dry suit and the water temperature is 41 degrees. But, and no pretty fish and coral either. Um, about 80 known ships in the uh, eastern basin here. And I'm going to take you to one of my favorites, St. James. I don't know how many people are familiar with the ship. It's located eight miles off of Long Point. It is a technical dive. It's below the recreational limit of 130. Um, but it's at 165 feet of water, which is light tech. It's not too technical. And uh, this is what the shipwreck looks like. That's, a, by the way, a Disney pirate ship. Um, this is a real shipwreck. Um, you would not find a ship like this in the ocean, simply because wooden ships don't last in the ocean. Torito worms eat the wood. Um, salt water is very corrosive on, on steel. In the cold, fresh water of the Great Lakes, a ship like this can exist for several hundred years. Uh, this ship went down in 1870, and this is what it looked like in the 2000s. Um, that's pretty darn good. That doesn't look that old, does it? Uh, the only thing missing on a lot of these ships is the rope and the sail. Everything else is pretty much still there. The, the metal, the wood, even the grain and the deck uh, below the cargo hold is still there. You can't find a shipwreck like this in the oceans. And this is one of the reasons why I love diving the Great Lakes is because of ships like this. Uh, this ship, uh, you kind of see, it's fully intact, sank slow. Uh, it's one of those ships that just went missing. You would not go out and find the ship by searching for it because nobody knew where it was. It, it left, uh, I think, uh, Toledo and was headed to Buffalo, the Welland Canal, and just never arrived. It could have been anywhere in Lake Erie. People found it off a long point. And at first, they didn't know what it was. They called it Schooner X until it was identified. Um, and it's one of those ships that just went missing. All seven crew are lost. Nobody knows why it sank. I can say it sank pretty slow, because the cabin's there. It was usually glued off. The all boat's missing. We probably got the all boat and didn't make it to shore for whatever reason. The uh, hatch covers are still in place on all three hatches. Uh, and everything is here. Just went down very slowly, I guess. Um, and I might point out this ship was made and uh, actually built in Milan, Ohio. Most people don't know where that is. Or if they do, they know it as Thomas Edison's birthplace. Milan is at, and it's Milan, by the way, not Milan, um, is seven miles inland. How do you build ships seven miles inland? So Milan in the 1850s was the second busiest grain port in the world, second only to a Russian grain port. How is that possible? Well, because they built a canal. And they built this huge artificial harbor, and they would actually bring ships in down the Huron River uh, between Cleveland and Sandusky uh, into the canal to this massive artificial harbor at the base of a hill, seven miles inland, where they would load grain onto ships. And they also had a big shipbuilding uh, port there as well. They built over 50 ships in Milan. This is one of them. Uh, it all kind of went to ruin when the railroads came in and things like that, and they did keep up the canal. But uh, nevertheless, the, the story of Ireland is a fascinating history. This is one of the ships that was built there. Here's another view of the ship from the stern. Uh, of course, we have the cabin, and ooh, look, a wheel. I always like seeing ship's wheels. The transom's beautiful. Uh, the underside of the ship is ice. Of course, the standing masts, I mean, wow, standing masts. I will point out, by the way, the main mast did come down over a couple of seasons several years ago. It's now laying diagonally like this but fortunately did not hit the cabin or do much damage otherwise. Uh, and that's part of the natural decay of shipwrecks. They are going to slowly fall apart, even in the Great Lakes. Um, it was found in 1984, they called it Schooner X. Ultimately it was identified because of registration and tonnage marks that were found right here on the forward hatch coming in the main, main beam. Um, and that's how you identify shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. They don't have their names on them. I've yet to see a ship with a name and a bell if you do find a bell, it's usually a Sears catalog, iron bell, stock bell. Um, <laughs> again, identifying these ships is really tough. If you don't find registration numbers, it's pretty much just going to be circumstantial evidence, length, width, special features, what type of cargo, number of masts, that sort of thing. This is what it looks like. Here's the cabin, a little silted in, but main companionway, grill over the stove uh, pipe, the uh, wheel half silted in. Lake Erie is a very silty lake, so it's a little unique. By the way, if you go to the other Great Lakes, they don't have this problem. And they, they, those ships actually keep teeter on their keels on a hard clay or rock bottom or sand bottom. They don't understand why ships get buried like in Lake Erie, because uh, they don't have to deal with silt. 
Here's the Ford mast, sheet winch, hand, uh, wooden pump. Here's a boom laying off to the side toward the bow. You can see a little bit of windlass there. Here's the uh, Woodstock anchors still hanging on the cat heads on the rail. Here's the cat head. Here's the fluke. It's been sitting there since 1870 when the ship sank. And they actually use it as a mooring, believe it or not. It's a strong point. It's still there after all these years. That's incredible. Like I said, these are Disney pirate ships. We're just missing the skeleton of the wheel. That's the only thing that's missing. And of course, one of the really cool things is the decoration under the bowsprit. This is a scroll head. It's the bowsprits and bob stay chains. Everybody, of course, has to get their picture taken with this thing. You don't find decoration on a lot of ships. Earlier ships, like in uh, the 18, 1850s, 60s, even you know, the 70s, they, they did do this. But it costs money. These ships are there to make money, not cost money. And so you kind of see decorations disappearing. But some of the ships do have scroll heads, and whatever you do, you really appreciate the decorative, artistic touch and the care of ownership that came with that. Okay, so this is a technical wreck. Not everybody here is a technical diver if you're a diver at all. And just because some of the really cool ships are in deep water doesn't mean you can't see cool ships in shallower water in, in just the Eastern Basin. Let me go to another wreck, actually one of my, my all-time favorite uh, recreational depth wreck, the trade wind. Also off the wrong point, just a few miles away from the St. James and 120 feet of water. This is what it looks like. That is really cool. This is uh, Barkentine. Barkentine, of course, manions three masts, four masts with square rigged, and the other two masts were schooner rigged, calf rigged. Um, what's really cool, all the mast structures laying out to the side of the wreck. You can see the main platform for the, and the, the uh, steps for the three masts that form the main four masts. Cross trees, you got booms and gaffs, you got all sorts of, all three masts are there. That is really cool. Um, it sank in a collision with the Charles Napier, uh, which was a, uh, another sailing vessel in a snowstorm in 1854. This is the collision hole here, and what's really cool is you see this big thing here? That's the jib boom of the ship that hit it, the Charles Napier. So you don't usually see parts of the other ship. This is the jib boom, and it's sitting there in the collision hole. Left it behind, and it pulled out and sailed back into the, the snowstorm and disappeared. It was carrying stoves in the cargo hold. You can still see stoves down here in the sill. Uh, and railroad rails, which look like matchsticks on the deck. Cabins there. Ooh, look, a wheel. It was really cool. Um, I always get really excited when I start seeing stuff like this. The dead eyes are all still there um, for the most part. Uh, windless and, of course, anchors at the bow. This is a really cool ship, and you could dive, dive after dive after dive and not see everything. Here's just some pictures of what it actually looks like when you're on the wreck. Here's the cabin. There's two companion ways. There's a little skylight here. And then, of course, what do you have over there? Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's the wheel. And it's really unusual. It's actually sunk down into the cabin roof. Um, which is weird, but you know what? Again, I've never seen this style of construction. I've never read anything on it. But this is an earlier built ship, and they did things that were not standard. And so you, this is why we dive shipwrecks, is to be able to see things, how they really did it. A lot of this is not documented. And this is kind of a very interesting wheel configuration and cabin configuration, full width versus cut down to a smaller size to allow people to go around the yeah, sides of it. Midships, you've got masts, you've got the, the uh, big, uh, these things here are actually the railroad rails lying on the deck, um, capstan, more railroad rails and masts and booms and all sorts of fun stuff. In the bow, you have the windlass, two iron stocked anchors, but not folding, and that actually can be used to date a wreck, means early, middle 1800s. Uh, folding would mean late 1800s, wood means 1870s, 1880s. Windless. Uh, most people see the two anchors. There's actually a third hidden anchor. I always give photos points to people who can see the third anchor. It's right here. It's a little kedging anchor hiding up under the windlass. Took me three years to notice that. So there's a lot to see and do on shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. And I've been asked why am I even interested in shipwrecks? Well, for one, they're history. They are really cool to look at too. But these are time capsules. Uh, these things are exactly pretty much the way they were when they went down. They have construction features and details of a time that's really long past. They really literally don't make them like this anymore. And uh, um, I really just love seeing stuff that very few other people can see. Uh, these are like museums, but no display cases, no velvet ropes. It's all there for you to look at. Some people have asked me what's the most coolest thing I've ever seen in a shipwreck. I answer a wooden bucket with a wooden handle. It's like out of Heidi, you know, something like that. 
Common everyday item, I'm sure the people at the time never thought twice about it. I was on a, a rack up in Lake Huron, I was laying on the deck, and I must have spent five minutes out of my 20 minute bottom time, because it was a technically deep wreck, looking at this bucket laying on the deck. And I, I imagine 100 years from now, somebody's gonna be looking at a plastic bucket like we would think twice about, on some, some vessel, something somewhere, and be really in awe of this plastic bucket. But they don't make wooden buckets with metal hoops and wooden handles and things like that anymore. So there's tons of stuff to really see and do. Tools that nobody knows even what they're used for anymore, I suspect, at least most people don't. There's a lot of stuff that you can read about for, if you're interested, this is kind of my standard list uh, in my website, Clue has its website. Since I get a lot of my talks in Ohio, Ohio actually has a big website on all the shipwrecks in Ohio water that are now in the document. So there's a lot to see and do out there. Um, I encourage you guys to do, keep doing the good work that you've been doing, um, surveying shipwrecks in the Pennsylvania waters. Uh, there's a lot of them out there, and uh, there's a lot uh, of work to do. So thank you, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. All right. Nice job. <laughs> All right. Questions for Kevin? I covered it all that thoroughly. Wow. Yeah, he's good. <laughs> what about the zebra mussels there, Kevin? What are your thoughts on uh, damage that the zebra mussels are doing to the wrecks? Okay, so the question is zebra mussels. And actually, they're quagga mussels. They are no longer zebras. Zebra mussels have been outcompeted by the quagga. Uh, the quagga mussel is pretty much the dominant mussel. Zebras only exist in rivers now and creeks and things like that. And the quagga, unfortunately, goes down very deep. Uh, four, five, six, seven hundred foot. It doesn't seem to be any depth limit. Um, the damage, and the question is, what sort of damage are they doing? Um, and they're actually doing a lot of damage. One, when they attach themselves to wood and then they die, they actually pull little pieces of the wood off. Uh, there's a name board on a ship up in Lake Huron, and when I started diving it, it had the name, Cornelia B. Wingate on the name board. It was carved in, it wasn't painted. Um, quag muscles started showing up uh, replacing the zebra mussels, which couldn't go that deep. And within two or three years, of course, you couldn't read the name because it was too thick, and so people would scrape the zebra mussels off with their hand. After about one or two seasons, it's now a blank board. It's sanded smooth. You can't read the name anymore, even if you wipe away the zebra mussels. They also are changing the acidity of the water in their immediate area around them. Uh, they're actually corroding the metal and attacking the wood chemically as well. Um, and then there's the zebra mussel poop problem. Um, a lot of the wrecks here, some of the earlier divers know, stuck way out of the, the bottom. They are now completely buried. The depth hasn't changed. What's happened is the zebra mussel poop is collecting everywhere, and it's actually filling in these wrecks. Um, to give you an idea, I think, of the destructiveness of these quagga mussels on a shipwreck, I have to go to the Hamilton Scourge in Lake Ontario. For those that aren't familiar with the Hamilton Scourge, those are the War of 1812 ships that went down um, uh, in Lake Ontario in about 300 feet of water in a storm. They, they were American warships. And they were discovered in the eight, 1970s. And National Geographic has a famous thing with a picture of the figurehead on the cover. And they you know, did submersible dives on them. And they're beautiful. Uh, bare wood, um, cutlasses hanging on the bulkheads, cannons on the deck and body skeletons of the crew seen down inside the, the ship. And the masts were standing, all the, everything was there except for the sail and the rope. Really well preserved. Um, unfortunately, they're in Canadian waters and for unknown reasons, the United States Navy, which usually calls possession of any American warship anywhere in the world, handed their ownership over to Canada, which usually is very good at conserving shipwrecks, but they, Canada then gave it inexplicably to the city of Hamilton. These people knew nothing about shipwrecks and what to do with them, so they just banned all diving on them. These ships went all the way for 30, 40 years without hardly anybody seeing them. They were, people were finally given permission in around 19, or 2012, 13, to finally dive these ships after having been seen almost 30 years. And what they found was devastating. They're covered in quaggas. Um, the quagga weight has brought down a lot of the mass structures and the yards and things like that. They've completely, the quagga poop has filled in the wrecks. They're buried. You can't see hardly anything now. The open gun ports and all are all filled in with sediment and the bones are missing. They incorporated the calcium from the bones into their shells. 
They literally dissolved away the remains. So that's how destructive quaggas are to shipwrecks. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, right now, Lake Superior is the last lake with no quaggas in it. Uh, hopefully, it remains that way. The water chemistry doesn't seem to be very conductive for them, um, but they certainly have been pretty destructive everywhere else. Uh, lake Erie and Lake Ontario have had zebras for quite some time, and we've learned to deal with them. In fact, now it's kind of this cycle of lots of them and then none of them, and that's due to predation from uh, um, the goby, which eats them, comes from the same area of the world, the Black Sea area, as well as the fact that I think these guys have been so good at filtering the water, they're starving themselves. When they first showed up, boy, you just slice your glove open and your finger open with these, these things. Now you can crush them with your fingers. They're paper-thin shells. They don't have a whole lot of building material, a lot of calcium stuff. They're kind of nutrient starved. And there will be times where wrecks are like pretty densely covered. And then next year, bare wood and metal. So we're kind of going through the cycle right now, at least off the Cleveland area, lots of them, none of them. It'll be interesting what happens in the other lakes, like Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, that are now attack, being attacked by the deeper quaggas, whether eventually these things will starve themselves and drop off, or whether they're going to hang around for a long time, um, maybe go through cycles like we're seeing in shallow waters here in the Lake, lake Erie area. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that primarily through side scan sonar, and, and was that funded, was that private people, was that public funding? Okay, so the question is, uh, clues shipwrecks. There's found about 20, 25 of them. That's actually probably a lot. It's probably close to 30 now. Um, and who funds it? How do we find them? What type of technology do we use? Um, it started out with just Dave and me spending out of our pockets. All our own equipment's bought by us. Dave bought his own boat. Tom bought his own boat. Uh, we own so many side scans now, um, and magnetometers. Um, those are the main primary tools that we use, and a lot of research. Um, it's a lot of water out there, and sometimes, like I said, it takes us several years to find shipwreck. The Riverside, it's a beautiful three-masted schooner about uh, 25 miles off of Cleveland, and it took us four years to find that ship. And can you imagine the gas cost to get out there and back? Uh, maybe two or three trips a season, year after year. We ended up searching almost 26 square miles before we finally found it. And uh, that's expensive. We've been very fortunate. We have a working relationship now with the Great Lakes Historical Society. And they pay our gas money, which we really appreciate. Now, boat maintenance, equipment, all that we still own and use on our own. We pay for that ourselves. You know, because if you're not spending money on your hobby, you're just not having fun. Um, <laughs> We did find one shipwreck of the magnetom or a sub-bottom profiler. So that's the Lockwood. It's one of the largest, not the largest, but one of the largest wooden steamers lost in Lake Erie. Uh, it's over 300 foot long, or just approaching 300 foot long, 45 foot beam, and nobody could find it, given very good positional information from two different government surveys when it sank in the early 1900s. How could anybody not find it? Well, we found out why. It's 15 feet under the silt. The only way we were able to prove it was there was with a sub-bottom profiler. We towed it, and we actually, because we have a good working relationship with Imagetics, they actually loaned it to us. And this is an $80,000 piece of equipment. And they loaned it to us, and we went out and sort of went back and forth over an area we had magnetometer hits, and people long suspected was the area based on a very little bit of debris peeking out of the bottom. It's actually a lifeboat data just sticking out of the bottom, inexplicably. Um, and sure enough, we got this cigar-shaped target from the sub-bottom profiler. So we have used one sub-bottom profiler to find one shipwreck, or at least prove for conclusively it's there. Because uh, magnetometers tell you there's something there, but you don't know what it is. Um, but mostly it's side scan sonar. And by the way, I might point out, magnetometers are actually really good, but not for reasons people think. Uh, we always tow at least one magnetometer and one side scan off the back of the boat. The reason for that is the side scan is really good for looking out to the side. It's not looking down. And if you turn on your, your bottom profiler, it tends to interfere with the signal of the side scan. So uh, you always want to leave your bottom profi sub profiler off, you know, your fish finder. So nobody's watching right below you. And the Sultan took us two times to find it. Very first time, we literally passed right over the top of it. We were not tanning the magnetometer. And we ended up searching other areas. We eventually had to go back to our very first box. And on the second leg, we found it. 
because we passed right over it the first time. And side scans don't see things under the boat. And a magnetometer does. It'll start singing when you go over anything that's man-made. It's also very good for discerning, is that a pile of rocks? Or is that a man-made ship that was carrying rocks? It's really hard to tell the difference. Fish nets look a lot like boat underwater, wasp, phantom nets. Um, but they don't show up with a magnetometer. So magnetometers will tell you, is this an interesting target or not? And it keeps an eye on what's under the boat, uh, where side scans can't do that. Any other? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what's your ratio between uh, doing this uh, the profile and searching for the shipwreck versus uh, diving and surveying? Well, not enough diving, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, most all of our time is spent searching in the summer, and all the winter is spent researching. Um, the amount of time, I would say 98% of the time is searching. Um, like I said, sometimes we go years without finding the shipwreck. And uh, we've been at it close to 20 years now, coming up 18 years. And uh, we actually have a pretty good odd, odds. I mean, sometimes we find two or three or four in the season, and you just can't dive them all. Uh, in good weather, you always want to go out and search. You don't want to go diving. So the diving kind of gets pushed off a little bit. Um, but ultimately, when we find a really good target, we're really motivated to go dive it almost immediately. Nobody dives the day we find these ships, by the way, because... Search gear takes up the whole boat. Dive gear takes up the whole boat. So you can't have both. So you got to go short, swap equipment out. So it's always another day that we come back and dive our target. Is that the question you were asking? No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, everybody thinks searching is exciting for the first 15 minutes. <laughs> the next 12 hours is excruciating. Um, and then the next day, and the next day, and the next week, and maybe the next summer. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's not for everybody. I'll say that. Um, when it's great, it's great when you find something and you come back a week later, the next day, whatever, and dive something. But that's an infrequent thing compared to the searching. Any other questions? Yeah. Have you looked for the Marquette specimen or two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we have ideas. Um, that's a really tough target because pretty much the search area is the entire central basin of Lake Erie. Um, we know, of course, you know, it was passing from Conneaut over to Port Stanley. It didn't make it to Port Stanley. Some say it did and turned around. Whatever. We know the wind was coming out of the west. It turned into the west at some point because just several weeks before, the cloud had done exactly the same thing. Big storm, no, no gate on the, the stern of this car ferry. This, by the way, Marquette Vessel number two is the car ferry. 300 and plus foot ship that sank in the central base. It should have stuck out of the water when it sank. It's massive. How do you lose a essentially a small ocean liner in the central base of Lake Erie? It's not deep enough to hold it. Um, he also certainly turned his nose into the wind and checked the speed down, waiting out the storm. This time, it did work. Something happened. They did have indications of sinking because of a lifeboat full of bodies that was found right off the shore here. But nobody knows what happened or where it decided to turn into the wind. Anywhere along the line going across the lake, it did it, checked its speed down, who knows how far they went before whatever happened that eventually got them this time. But that pretty much means the entire central basin of Lake Erie is the search zone. So have we searched for it? Not explicitly because you pretty much have to search everything. We'll find a lot of the ships along the way, but that's a lot of searching. Um, there are other ideas we have how we're finding. Um, and some research ideas, uh, as well as maybe uh, some, uh, some other means of searching in a more efficient manner. So far, nothing's panned out. Um, but ultimately, it probably will be found unless the Lockwood comes back to haunt us. Remember I mentioned a really large wooden steamer just disappeared entirely under the silt? Our fear is that might have happened in the market in Bessemer. That's why nobody's found it in over 100 years. It's possible. Can't say it, that's what happened to it. But maybe that's why nobody could find it. I mean, that thing just stuck out of the water. So maybe it's a possibility. That's about all I can say about it. Yeah. The uh, various government research vessels that work Lake Erie, do they share any of their information with you? No. <laughs> no. Uh, we found that trying to get information from government agencies, from fishermen, is very tough. Um, 
you know, they are public records, and if you know where to go to the public records, you can get the information, but they will not give it to you. You have, uh, fortunately, Jim Pasker, Tom Kowalczyk, or especially Jim, are research wizards. They know the federal archives inside and out. They know the state archives. They know Canadian archives. And now with a lot of things getting scanned and digitized, it's getting easier to even research. You don't have to drive to Washington, D.C. or Chicago or any place like that anymore. You can just do it online if you have the right subscriptions and know exactly where to look. But that's really your best way of getting information. Um, they don't really share much. I, in fact, only know one case recently where a government search vessel, the, uh, the Lake Guardian, actually came across the shipwreck and said, hey guys, we found something. Uh, that was a find uh, up in uh, Lake Huron off of Port San Juan. Uh, back about five years ago. And that's the first and only time I've heard of that happen. So, now you're going to have to do your own research. Nobody's going to hand the numbers to you. Yeah? Um, have you ever found treasure? <laughs> have I ever found treasure? You know, I always say that the ships themselves are the treasure. Uh, and that's really true. I mean, as you can see, there's some beautiful shipwrecks. Um, I will point out that the, the Spanish Armada never made it past Niagara Falls. So, good luck with that gold. Um, there is something called Great Lakes gold, by the way. It's called copper. Uh, copper is kind of the most valuable thing you could ever find on a shipwreck. Um, it's so valuable that people go to incredible lengths to get this copper back when the ship sinks. A good example is the Plavik. Sank off of Alpena and Lake Huron, Thunder Bay. And it was in 180 feet of water. And it sank in the late 1800s, loaded with copper. Over 20 years, they got every ounce of copper off that ship by clamshelling, by uh, early one atmosphere suit divers, by hard hat divers. People went after that. They found it, and they relentlessly went after it to get that treasure. Uh, one of the ships we found that the uh, Anthony Wayne was supposedly a treasure ship. Uh, supposedly there's gold bullion on the safe. I will point out that when that ship sank in 1850, there were hard hat divers in Lake Erie. Um, people like Johnny Green um, in Harrington. There were divers. If somebody had their gold aboard, they would have hired those divers. And by point out, the mast did stick out of the water the first season. That ship would have been very easy to find. Send divers out and go get your gold. So the end result is, is that you're not going to find treasure on these ships. These ships were hauling pretty much what you find on Lakers today. Uh, bulk grain, uh, coal, things like that, sulfur. You're not going to find treasure on these ships. The owners would have gotten that treasure most likely back in the day. And uh, uh, even if they couldn't find the ship, these ships did carry lots of treasure. There were no gold Spanish galleons uh, in the Great Lakes. And in fact, I might point out, you know, of course, a lot of people may be familiar with Schooner G uh, off the coast here, the Dunkirk Schooner. Um, the, the treasure hunting company came in, tried to claim was carrying a, a secret British gold shipment. Nobody sent valuable stuff by boat. That always went over land because you could lose it. So nobody did that. And, you know, of course it turned out it's not that ship at all. It's not even the Caledonia like they claim. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, no treasure. The treasure is the ships. Uh, like you saw that ship with the standing masts and the, the wheel and the cabin. That's the treasure, the ship itself. Any other questions? Uh, we buy them commercially. One of the wonderful things that's happened in the past uh, 20 years, 15 years, is the cost has really come down on search equipment. I mean, it used to be the cheapest side scan you get your hands on was $65,000 strip bare. Um, you can now go out and buy um, a shark marine um, a towfish that's actually pretty good, you know, for about $12,000. You can get a hummingbird which is kind of a, it's a side scan, not you know really great one, but you can get Omnibird for a couple hundred bucks. Um, the cost has really come down on side scans in general. Uh, the cost of building these transducers, which was always the big money part of the, they've really gotten good at that over the years. And, and there's dozens and dozens of companies now that sell very affordable systems, side scan systems for under $20,000, and they're even breaking under $10,000 now. So, yes, we actually built our first site scan, but we only used it for half a season before we just went out and bought a commercial one. It's so much easier. 
Uh, it's hard enough finding shipwrecks without having to worry about building your own equipment. And given the lower cost of stuff these days, it's just easier to buy. Except for self island profilers. I am not buying one of those. <laughs> any other questions? I got one last one, maybe. Sure. Kevin, is there an 1850 submarine in the middle of Lake Erie? Yeah, so the question is, is there a submarine in Lake Erie? Yes, there is. There is the Lauder Phillips submarine. Somewhere near the side paddle wheel or Atlantic off to Log Point. Sank in 1854, before the Civil War, before the Hunley. There is a submarine in Lake Erie that predates the Hunley by 10 years in Lake Erie. Nobody quite knows what it looks like. Um, there was a newspaper description of what it looked like when it was on a railroad. The guy, lived, um, the inventor, lived in Chicago. And he actually shipped his submarine by rail through Detroit and then along the North Shore of Canada to get to the side paddle wheel or Atlantic. Uh, remember I mentioned everybody went to get their treasure? So the side paddle wheel or Atlantic uh, collided with another ship uh, off a long point, sank in 160 feet of water. Um, and this is in 1852. Um, there was a purser safe aboard with bonds that was relatively available. Um, uh, it was paper money, but you know, as long as it wasn't too old, they could get it. And divers in the 1850s, 10 years before um, the Civil War, there were two hard hat divers out there, Johnny Green and Harrington. And in between Johnny Green actually getting the safe out of the deck and then going up and getting bent, uh, you know, of course they knew nothing about the bends in those days. Uh, there were no recompression chambers. Um, he went off to recover. Uh, the inventor of the submarine came in and tried to get that safe. Unfortunately, they, they wisely decided to do a test dunk in you know, relatively deep waters, and it started filling with water. So they pulled it up, made repairs, and they thought, well, let's, let's go do it again. And they went some distance off the Atlantic, dunked it, and somehow the rigging fouled and it dropped to the bottom and was lost. It's out there somewhere. It's probably buried pretty deep under the silt. Uh, the Atlantic is under at least 15 feet of silt, 20 feet of silt. So it's under at least that probably. Uh, but it's out there. Uh, you'll need a sub-bottom profile to find it, a magnetometer maybe. Nobody really knows what it looks like. It could look anything like from a perch to a big tube like the Hunley. Nobody even knows really what it looks like. But it's out there. And that would be a real historic thing to find. It's also a neat old haystack. It'd be tough to find. Still encouraging though, right? It's out there. It's <laughs> tough to find it. And dig for it. That'll be the hard part. All right, folks, let's have a round of applause for Kevin McGee. All right, well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Appreciate your time. No problem. Nice to see you, folks. If you'd like to you'd go up, uh, you know, the we've got to kind of wrap stuff up by 9 o'clock here, but if anybody might wants to make a run through the shipwreck exhibit, uh, we'll keep the show running up there if you hadn't had a chance to go through. Kevin, you'll be in the neighborhood for just a little bit if yeah, anybody wanted to come that. share some secret treasure locations with you. <laughs> you will make yourself available. But thanks again, folks, for taking out uh, time to come recognize the divers. Can we have one last round of applause for the past survey divers? Thank you.